OK, you good to go. OK, well, welcome everyone to today's webinar uh, is OER 101, the nuts and bolts of open educational resources. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Janelle Baskin. I'm the student success and open education librarian in Walker Library. Um, and I oversee the OER program here at NTSU. So I'm thrilled to have so many that uh, registered for today and were interested in this topic. I see some familiar faces as well as some new faces, so that's good. Uh, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, that would be helpful. If everybody just wants to like share maybe your name and what your role is here at NTSU so we can kind of see the different kinds of participants that have showed up today, that would be great. Um, and before I turn it over to David, I'm going to give a few quick announcements about the webinar. So we are recording it. Um, it will be available later on the library's YouTube channel. So if you have to duck out in the middle, you can catch the rest of it later. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, please drop those in the chat. And then once we get to the end, whatever time we have left, we'll try to go through all those questions as much as we can. So please put questions in the chat. Um, I wanted to briefly share about a new uh, MTSU grant program that supports OER initiatives. Uh, that we got some generous funding this year from the provost office to, to pilot a program out of the library um, that we're calling Affordable Course Materials Grant Program. Um, let me put that link in the chat so you guys can check it out if you want more information. Um, and so that call, uh, the CFP went out October the 1st. And we're um, accepting applications through October 31st. So we still got two more weeks. So if you have an idea or if you have a question you want to chat with me about, feel free to email me. I'd love to talk to you all about it. And we're excited about doing that in the library. So uh, lastly, I just wanted to say a sincere thank you to the LTNITC and also MTSU Online for co-sponsoring this webinar today, helping us promote it, get the word out and really partnering with us on, on OER has been super. So, all right. So I'm gonna introduce our speaker. We're truly honored to have uh, Dr. David Wiley here with us today. Dr. Wiley is the Chief Academic Officer of Lumen Learning and one of the founders of the Open Educational Resources Movement. So Dr. Wiley, thank you so much for being here and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks for the invitation. Um, to come and share a little with you today. I was saying just before we started that um, when I was still full-time faculty, I used to teach a semester long course on this topic. So trying to do it in an hour is uh, is kind of fun, but uh, always grateful for the chance to, to talk about OER. And I also wanna say that I'm particularly grateful uh, to Janelle who took the time to send me a list of um, questions. The questions that she hears most often from people around campus um, about OER. And so I'm just going to use that list of questions that I hope are um, some of the questions that you've come kind of looking for answers to as the table of contents for today. And we'll just work our way through here. I don't think we'll take the whole time. Um, but if you do have a, a question or a thought, either you know, feel free to either drop it into the chat. I will try to keep one eye on the chat. I'm not sure how successful I'll be. <laughs> Maybe Janelle can help me uh, monitor that. But I hope that there's plenty of time for us to talk uh, at the end. So this is where we're going to start. So what does it mean for something to be open? Is there a difference between OER and open access? Open licenses, adapting and customizing and remixing. Why would I want to openly license my work? How do I share OER? Are OER peer reviewed? How can they be high quality if they're free? What are OEP and open pedagogy? Shifting my class to OER seems like a lot of work. Is it worth it? What are the benefits? And then can I use generative AI to author OER? And how do I how do I find OER to use um, in my teaching? So that's where we're gonna go. So I'm gonna start by um, I've actually Im embedding a play within a play, a presentation within a presentation here. Um, a couple of years ago, I was the education fellow at Creative Commons. Um, and so part of what that meant was that I kind of stomped around the country advocating for people to adopt Creative Commons licenses and explaining how they work. And as part of that role, I created this presentation, which is kind of the shortest possible introduction to OER, the five R's in Creative Commons. So I thought we would just start there. Um, in terms of definitions, 
uh, open educational resources here at the top. And I'll just say that um, it seems like every everyone who's ever published a paper about OER or uh, started a institutional initiative around OER has created their own bespoke license for what open educational resources are. Um, and the definition I'm using here is the one that is uh, used by the Hewlett Foundation, which is for 20 years now been the primary kind of philanthropic funder of work in OER, as well as Creative Commons and, and a couple of other big organizations. But open educational resources are materials that are either one, in the public domain, or two, licensed in a manner that provides everyone with free and perpetual permission to engage in the 5R activities. Okay, we'll talk more about the 5Rs in some detail below. Uh, but Creative Commons is an organization, a nonprofit, that creates copyright licenses that are very easy for a copyright holder to apply to their own works in order to grant uh, these permissions to others, as long as uh, those other people meet specific conditions. So that's a quick overview. We'll do more detail here. Okay, so this is the definition that we just talked about. Um, either being in the public domain or being licensed in a particular way. So open ed educational resources are all about copyright. Uh, an open educational resource is a resource that's either in the public domain, which means it's not protected by copyright at all, either its copyright has expired, or perhaps it's a work that was never eligible for copyright protection, or it's a work that is copyrighted, but that has been licensed in a way that gives you permission to do these things that we call the 5R activities. And the five R's are just a shorthand way of remembering all the specific activities that a license has to grant you in order for a resource that's licensed that way to be considered an open educational resource. We know what educational resources are, right? Things like textbooks or uh, journal articles or essays or photographs. So th there are lots of things that we can use educationally, but for it to be an open educational resource, you have to be permitted to engage in these five very specific activities. Okay, so the first one and the most fundamental, the kind of foundational R is retain. You have to be able to make, own, and control a copy of the resource. So we're not talking about something um, like a movie that you would watch on, on uh, Netflix or a song that you would listen to on Spotify. Um, or even most journal articles that you'd access through a, um, you know, a library subscription. Those are materials that you have access to, but um, generally speaking, they either make it difficult or impossible for you to make a copy that you own, you download, you control, you can do anything you want to do with it for the rest of your life. Um, more and more media are moving to this kind of subscribe and access model as opposed to a own your own copy of a resource kind of model. But that's foundational. You have to be able to do that. Once you've made a copy of a resource and downloaded it to your computer, then you have to be able, you must have legal permission to do these other four things as well, which is, so revise means either to edit it, adapt it, modify it. That could be translating it into another language. It could be adjusting the reading level um, to work with students who are at a different reading level. It could be changing it from uh, you know, a text resource into some interactive resource. Uh, revising is all about editing and adapting and modifying. Remixing is about taking one resource and one or two or three or six other resources and combining them into a mashup to create something new. And you must have legal permission to revise, to edit, adapt, modify. You must have legal permission to remix. And once you've revised and remixed, or even if you haven't revised or remixed, you must have permission to take your copy and then go out into public and display it, show it, perform it, all, all the kinds of uh, performance rights around copyright. You have to be able to use that resource on a public website, in a, in a talk that you would give like this, and when you're teaching in class, um, you have to be able to actually use the resource. And then finally, redistribute means you must have legal permission to make more copies of the original that you downloaded or the revision that you made or the remix that you created. 
and take those and put them online out where other people can download them themselves and kind of keep the, keep the party going. Okay, so if I have formal copyright license permission to engage in all of these activities, then we would say that we're talking about an open educational resource. Uh, or again, if we're looking at a resource that's in the public domain where there's no copyright prohibiting me from engaging in any of these activities, then we're talking about an open educational resource as well. Um, actually, let's just pause here for a second. Any questions about the five R's? Because it's really important to wrap your head around these. This is, this is the core of what it means for something to be open. Questions either in the chat or if you want to unmute and ask, that would be fine too. Okay. If something comes through in the chat, I'll try to watch out for it. So I mentioned that Creative Commons um, creates and stewards a family of copyright licenses that make it super easy for me and for you and other people who aren't IP lawyers to license our work to people in order to give them permission to engage in these five R activities. Um, as of 2021, there were over 2 billion works uh, that had been licensed with one of the Creative Commons licenses. And I believe now I just heard that that number is up to two and a half billion as of the most recent count. Um, I'm gonna spend, I don't know, three or four minutes on the Creative Commons licenses in as much as OER are about copyright and licensing, I think you're you're very much benefited by having a high level understanding of what's going on with the Creative Commons licenses. So if you'll uh, indulge me, I want to spend three or four minutes here. So there are six Creative Commons licenses. All six of them require that the person who's going to use, let, let's just pretend that you've created a resource, you're going to put a Creative Commons license on it and send it out into the world. All six of these Creative Commons licenses would require whoever makes use of your resource to attribute you as the author and creator of the resource. So you have to be attributed. Then number two, there are a set of options around how derivative works, revises and remixes can be created and distributed. And then there are also a set of provisions around whether people can make commercial use of your material or not. So we'll just say a little bit more about each of those, and I'll show you a table that really kind of brings them all together. So um, as I mentioned, all of the licenses have this attribution condition, and you'll recognize it when you see the Creative Commons licenses, they always have these little icons on them. And this one of the person just represents the idea that you have to give credit back to the person who's the original creator. So if I had created uh, and open uh, a textbook and put a Creative Commons license on it. And let's say that you were gonna distribute that to students in your class. Somewhere you would need to attribute me as the original author. That's a requirement of the license. And if you don't do that, then you're actually violating copyright law because the copyright license says you have permission as long as you do these things. So you have to attribute the original author. Derivative works um, are making this is a this is a jargon, a technical term in copyright land. Um, it's not just making any change to a copyrighted work. It has to be a fairly substantive change. It has to be a change that is significant enough that you deserve your own new copyright on the thing that you've created. So a clear example of a derivative work would be making a book into a movie. Obviously, so much goes into making a movie. The movie deserves its own, deserves its own copyright independent of the original book. We're translating an essay from one language into another, ton of work. Um, and the new, the version of the essay in the new language would be deserving of its own copyright. These are derivative works um, when the Creative Commons licenses talks about them. Um, things that are clear non-examples would be correcting punctuation errors or spelling errors Doing that kind of technical editing isn't going to result in a new copyright for you as a technical editor. Or converting a written essay from PDF into an HTML format, that's not going to result in new copyright for you because you haven't really done anything significantly creative to change the work. So with regard to derivative works, the Creative Commons licenses give three options. And you, as the 
person who's applying a license to the work that you own the copyright to, you can choose which of these um, you know, makes you happiest. The first is if there's no mention of derivative works in the, in the license that you choose, it means that anyone's free to create and share derivative works and, and do whatever they'd like. The second uh, version of this derivative works condition has this arrow curling back on itself. And uh, this is called the share alike condition or the share and share alike condition. And it means that if, if I publish a work and I license it under a license with one of these share alike conditions, and then you take that work and you do something really amazing to it and create your own derivative work, you are required to license your derivative work in the same way that I had licensed my original work. That's what the share alike condition means. And then there is a, um, there's a condition called no derivatives, which is represented by this equal sign that says that you can create derivatives for your own purposes, but you are not allowed to share those derivatives with others. And obviously, I hope it will be obvious to you from what we've said so far, that if you choose to apply one of the licenses that includes this condition to your work, your work will not be an open educational resource because it, this condition does not allow you to create and redistribute derivatives. But um, in terms of the question of what's the difference between OER and open access, a lot of uh, open access we typically use when we're talking specifically about research publications like journal articles. A lot of open access journal articles will use this no derivatives condition, which is good and bad. I mean, you wouldn't want someone to go in and start editing, like changing the number of participants in the study or changing the value of the statistic that had been calculated or making those kinds of changes. So from that perspective, um, you know, prohibiting changes being made seems like it makes sense. On the other hand, it keeps them from being translated into other languages and a range of things that would be really helpful and useful from being able to be done. Uh, so you will see this no derivatives condition sometime in the open access side of the house, which is more kind of in the library with research journals and research articles, um, but never in the open educational resources world. Um, and then commercial use, um, we're gonna see over here in just a moment that sometimes you'll see this icon that has your local currency with a slash through it. Um, and this means that whatever you do with the resource, you're not allowed to use it commercially. Um, if that icon isn't present, then you can do anything you want to do with the resource. And I will say, just to give you a very quick bit of history, 20 years ago, when the Creative Commons licenses first came out, gosh, 22 years ago now, um, a lot of people opted to use this non-commercial condition because they're like, well, I'm sharing this for the public good and I don't want people to commercialize it and turn it into, uh, you know, to profit off of it or something else. Um, and we've learned two things, or uh, we've learned a couple of things over the last two decades. Um, but one of those things we've learned is that no one actually knows what is and what is not a commercial use. Creative Commons have even said multiple times, even though they're the authors of the license, they don't know what constitutes a commercial use and what does not. <clears throat> and so over time, the field has moved away from using this license because there's a lot of ambiguity around what you are allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Um, and the only person who can really make that determination authoritatively for you is a judge. When the person who's non-commercially licensed something takes you to court for uh, a use that they deem to be commercial. And a couple of years ago, Creative Commons did a worldwide survey of people who uh, apply Creative Commons licenses to their own work and people who use works that are licensed Creative Commons to try to understand what they believe non-commercial meant. And they provided a bunch of use cases. Would this be a commercial use, yes or no? And actually the majority of people in that survey believed that using re a resource in a class for which students had to pay tuition to attend constituted a commercial use. Um, now, obviously about half the people don't feel that way, but it turns out many people do feel that way. Um, most of us teach at institutions where tuition is required. So like I said, over time, uh, you'll see fewer and fewer works using this non-commercial condition. So this is how those 
conditions all come together to create the six Creative Commons licenses. As I said before, all the licenses require attribution. So on these, oops, so on these little badges, you'll see the little person here on each of them. And the little abbreviation for that is by, as in this work was originally created by. Um, so all of them require attribution, but then there are, you know, there are these three that allow commercial use. You'll see the dollar sign with the strike through it is missing. And then three that prohibit commercial use. You'll see the dollar sign with the strike through is there. All right. And then in terms of derivatives, if we look at this first column, these first two licenses, you can create derivatives, share them, do anything you want to do with them. In the second column, you can create derivatives and then share them, but only if you share them under the same license as the original. And then in this third column, derivatives cannot be shared at all. So as you look at all this, you think, my gosh, there's a lot going on here. This is really confusing. You'll understand why over the last 22 years, the field has really coalesced around this license, which is called the attribution license, whose only requirement is that you attribute the original author. You can do anything you like, as long as you just attribute the original author. That's the Creative Commons licenses in a nutshell. If we think about them and how they kind of work with the five R's, then you'll see that the attribution license requires you, definitely allows you to engage in all five of those R's as long as you attribute, as does this by SA license is the share alike. Um, as long as you're sharing your revises and remixes under this same license, um, you can do all the five R's. And then non-commercial starts creating questions about what we, are, what we are and aren't allowed to do. And no derivatives says that I can't really share my revises or remixes. Uh, but the key thing to take away is that 22 years of tens of thousands of people licensing work under CC licenses is that the majority of us, at least in the open educational resources space, have coalesced around this attribution license. So for example, um, Lumen Learning, where I work, we license everything that we create under the attribution license. The other licenses, our experience has been, it's just kind of too hard for people to wrap their heads around. They don't really know what they are and aren't allowed to do and when and under what conditions. Um, I think I think that's kind of repetitive. I think we've said that. Okay, so that's a little bit about the definition of OER, the five R's, revising, remixing, um, some things like that. Hey, Dave, can I ask a short question? I wish you would. I'd be glad to. So first of all, so glad you're here. Um, Thanks, I, I, so I actually had, I had like three questions, but the first one was, which R do you see most commonly excluded or abused of the five R's? Most commonly excluded? Yeah, or, you know, not maybe not considered, something like that. Well, I would say that people, um, so for first, um, when I first published this framework back in the 2000 aughts sometime, 2007, 2008, it was only these bottom four. Um, because we, we were still living in a world where people mostly kind of owned private property. It was, it was only in the kind of middle half of the teens as these streaming service business models, both academically in the library, but then also around movies and TV shows and music and things like that. As the world started moving into just, just subscribe and access, you don't really need to own anything. As that became more prevalent, um, it became clear that you can't do any of these other four if you can't do this first one, right? So... I would say the one that's the easiest to overlook is retain. And it's the one that, um, it, you know, back in the day, you could just come up here to the top left in your web browser and hit file, save as, and download whatever file you were looking at. But it seems like um, people have gone to great technological lengths to make it hard for you to do that. Um, especially when they're, you know, if there's some copyrighted resource that they're trying to maintain control over. Mm -hmm. So anyway, all of that to say, I think retain is the one that is the easiest to overlook. We just assume retain because none of the, none of the rest of these make sense. If you can't make your own copy, you can't change it, can't make a mashup with it, et cetera. Very good. Now, the other two things I wanted to ask, I know you, you gave a talk recently about AI and OER. So I wonder if you're going to summarize a little bit of that later. But then the, the immediate question is, can you talk about the difference? And maybe this is coming in your FAQs. Like there's a conflation 
with OER and free, like as in zero dollars. Mm -hmm. Can yeah. you talk? Because because some obviously some OER are not zero dollars. You can actually have a low cost OER, or I guess you could have a high cost OER. Can you talk about that just a little bit? <laughs> yeah. Um... I actually, I don't think I have it in here. I have, I have another slide um, that I didn't include in this deck. But basically, um, what tracing is right there are, if, if you think about a two by two table, right? Two in the top, two in the bottom. You can block out things that are openly licensed and things that aren't openly licensed and things that are free and things that aren't free. So free, not free in the columns, openly licensed, traditionally copyrighted in the rows. Okay. So there are lots of things that are free and fully copyrighted. For example, the entire public facing internet, all traditionally copyrighted, all freely available for you to access, right? Um, OER can also be free in, in certain formats, right? Like if I have a PDF file of a textbook um, I can just send that PDF file around to anybody and it, it doesn't really cost me anything to send an email with an attachment. I understand there's a fractional penny of it, like there's electricity and whatever. Um, but so things that are, things can be fully copyrighted and free, uh, but we also know that things can be fully copyrighted and have really high costs associated with them, like most of the textbooks that students get assigned. Um, but things can also be openly licensed and have some cost associated with them. So maybe the easiest example to wrap your head around would be if you took that PDF and printed it out and put it in a hard binding, it would still be openly licensed. But I, I mean, I guess, Trey, you're really wealthy. You could print hundreds of those and give them right. away for free, that's right. but that's probably not how that works, right? You probably end up selling those. Yeah. But the fact that it costs $50 to buy that hardcover, whatever, doesn't change the fact that what's inside it is openly licensed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that's the distinction. Um, some things are free but not open. Some things are open but not free. There are actually things that go in all four of those boxes, right? So I appreciate you asking that. That's a that's a good uh, that's a good clarification to make because a lot of times you'll see, and I hope I'm not saying anything that's going to offend anybody because I don't actually know the work happening at MTSU super well. Um, but sometimes people will say we have an OER program on campus. And then when what that actually turns into is a lot of encouragement to use library resources because they're available to students for free. Because what they really mean is they mean not it's not an OER program, it's an affordability program. And it's kind of weird to have an OER program where you're encouraging students to use fully copyrighted, traditionally copyrighted resources. There's a little bit of a, a mix there. But it's also true that, like I said, every place creates their kind of own definition for OER. So if the local definition for OER is thing is anything that is free or low cost, then you know then library resources would fit into that definition too. So it, I don't mean to be super kind of oh, annoying about the definition, but it turns out that the definition actually matters, especially when there's grant funding involved and you can qualify for this grant if you use OER or if you adopt OER. Okay, well what qualifies as OER now the definition really matters. Right. So um, thanks for that. So let me get in, into um, more of the questions that Janelle, Giselle, yeah, Janelle sent ahead of time. Sorry, I work with a woman called Giselle, and I in my head, I keep saying your name wrong. Janelle, I'm so sorry. Um, you know, one of the questions that uh, Janelle sent was, why would I openly license my work? And I, I would say there are two reasons here. One, um, openness facilitates the unexpected. So when you put something that you've created out into the world and tell people, you have my permission to do anything you wanna do as long as you attribute me, it turns out that they will do amazing, incredible things that you never could have imagined. And if they were only allowed to do a specific set of things that you explicitly permitted them to do, then there'd be a ton of innovation and a ton of good work with students that would just never get done. Because you can't, you can't see ahead of time all the ways that your resource might be used. So by openly licensing, openly licensing it, you're basically taking a position of humility and saying, 
I don't know what you're going to need to do with this to serve your students. I'm just giving you permission to do anything you need to do, anything you want to do. Just go and do it. Um, and then, you know, I've been, so I, um, I published the first open license for content back in 1998, four or five years before the Creative Commons licenses even came around. So I've been sharing my work in this way for 26 years now. And I could not tell you all the times I'm just delighted and surprised and amazed by the creative things that other people come up with, the ideas and ways that they use things I have shared that would never have occurred to me before. So this idea that you're letting this kind of unanticipated goodness be able to happen in the world, that's one of the reasons why you would openly license your work. Um, the second reason here, the more pragmatic reason, and this quote is from um, Tim O'Reilly, who is uh, kind of famous for saying that obscurity is a far greater threat than piracy. So if you are an author of an academic, if you've ever published an academic paper before, um, are you more concerned about copies of that paper being pirated and shared all around the world in violation of copyright? Or are you actually more concerned that nobody's ever going to find it or read it or cite it? Our main issue, we just want people to read the work, to use the work, to cite the work, to reference the work. Um, and particularly, and this is a whole nother talk, but where we generally are um, forced against our will to sign over our copyright to our research to journal publishers anyway. Uh, you know, there, there was nothing coming back to us financially with regard to our research papers anyway. Um, so in as much as obscurity is a lot greater threat than piracy, it just works to your advantage to make it as easy as possible as you can for other people to take your work, use it, do things with it, share it with others. Um, that, that one's a very self-serving kind of reason. You're going to get more citations on your article if you make it available under open licenses and send it out into the world because more people are going to read it. So there are some kind of idealistic reasons why you would openly license your work as well as some pragmatic ones. There's one additional reason, but I'm going to talk about it in a couple of minutes. Um, another question Janelle shared was, how do I share my OER? And the kind of minimum effort answer to this question is just put it online. Put it online anywhere that Google can index it. Because if Google can find it, then other people can find it. That's the kind of minimum effort to how you share. The additional effort of how you share is you actually do some marketing for your OER. And you might think, oh, I don't do marketing. I, I'm not sure what that would even mean. But by marketing, I just mean things like on your disciplinary list serve. You might put out an email that says, I just made this textbook on this topic available you know, to everyone in the world to do whatever they'd like to do with. Or you might talk about it in a conference presentation, or right? you find ways to make, to, to raise awareness of the fact that your OER exists. Um, oh yes, in, in the chat. Yeah, openness facilitates the unexpected is me. The other quote was Tim O'Reilly. Um, but at, at a minimum, you just need to get it online somewhere where it can be found by others. But then there's a whole host of things you can do to market and raise awareness around your OER. Um, is that the next one? Yes. Are OER peer reviewed? The answer, sadly, is mostly no. The vast majority of OER are not peer reviewed. And so just do a little thought experiment thinking about an OER that you would create. So you're teaching a class and you want to do some activity with them. So you create a resource and you say to yourself, hey, I bet other people would enjoy using this resource too. And if I shared it, it would save them some time. So I'm going to publish it. Before you publish it, are you going to say, you know what I really need to do is have three to five other people peer review this resource, uh, you know, and I want to go through this process before I'm going to share it and publish it on Google. No, that's not what you're going to do. So um, mostly, no, the vast majority of OER are not peer reviewed. But if peer review is important to you, then you can look for OER that are created by larger organizations that have more, um, I don't know, you'd call it. Have, have publication processes that look more like a traditional publisher would, like an OpenStax or a Lumen. Um, there are OER that are peer reviewed. It's just that 99% of them are not. But hopefully, when you find an OER that looks good to you and you're thinking, oh, I could use this in my class, then you would review it yourself and you would decide whether it met your needs or not, rather than assuming that somebody who teaches a different kind of student at a different kind of institution 
who did a review somewhere else can really tell you whether it's good for you and your students in your situation. How can OER be high quality if they're free? Well, first, I want to give what I will acknowledge as a slightly obnoxious answer to this question. And that is, to me, high quality learning materials means learning materials that are highly effective at supporting learning. That's what it means for learning materials to be high quality. So OER can be high quality the same way that expensive materials can be high quality. They just have to be designed in accordance with instructional design principles and learning science research. And if you do those things, then whether you're charging a lot of money or no money for your OER, they can be highly effective at supporting learning. Now, and I, I worried that this sounded like it's some kind of negative statement, but I don't mean it that way at all. But if by high quality, what you mean is they're, they're factually accurate, then you're not really talking, you're, you're really talking more about reference materials than you are about educational resources, right? Because educational resources need to have pedagogical features like learning objectives and advanced organizers and formative assessment and things like that. That's an educational resource. Um, if by high quality, you just mean, I wanna make sure that there are no errors, then I'm, I'm not sure that you're talking about an educational resource. But I, I recognize that these two responses are both kind of not, not actually answering the question that I think Janelle was trying to communicate to me. I think the question really was something like, why would people give away all their hard work for free and expect it to be any good? Um, so in addition to these first two quotes here, I've added, why would you not? Like, you've done all this work. It's sitting on your hard drive. Is the reason you're not sharing it because you, I'll just pick on Trey because I know Trey really well. You, Trey Martindale, you're going to do all the work associated with commercializing that content. You're going to put it in some DRM protected format and you're going to do marketing and you're going to set up credit card. Like you're going to do all the things. No, you're not going to do any of those things. It's just going to sit on your hard drive. So why would you not? You, you have literally nothing to lose because you're not going to commercialize it. Um, I mean, maybe in some cases, you might. And if you're going to, then that's awesome. Go ahead and do that. But if you're not going to, you really don't have anything to lose by sharing. You only uh, stand to benefit because people will do things with your resource. And a lot of the things they'll do will just be super interesting and amazing and awesome for them in their context. But sometimes they'll do things to your resource that make it better also for you. And now your resource has been improved with no effort on your part. Go and ahead. Dave, and Dave, if you had to estimate how how what percentage of, let's just say in North America, North America's amount of created educational resources over the last 20 years that are not and really couldn't be commercialized, but are still worthwhile. You know what I mean? What, yeah. what percentage is that? It, I would think it's 90, 95. 90, 90, I mean, Mostly people create educational resources because they have a need themselves, right? So if you create it, it's at least good enough. It's at least fit for purpose for you and what you want to do. If it's good enough for you and what you want to do, there are probably other people in the world similar enough to you that it would, it would work for them as well, right? And um, man, the amount of effort that it takes to commercialize something is just, it's so crazy. But yeah, it's, it's the overwhelming majority. Yeah, to your point. Totally agree. Okay. Part three, there's some questions about open educational practices and open pedagogy. I'm not going to answer that specific question for the following reason. If you were to do a literature review uh, to go scan the, all the literature related to open educational practices or to scan the literature related to open pedagogy, what you would find again is that basically every article makes up its own definition for both of those terms. And so something like um, collaboration is an open educational practice according to many definitions. Well, I'm pretty sure we were collaborating before open even became a thing. I don't know why that counts as an open educational practice. You can tell by now I'm a little hung up on definitions. Um, so both of those terms, I, 
I think I know what they're trying to mean. But a couple of years ago, a colleague and I published a paper. It's open access, so you can read it. It's about OER-enabled pedagogy, in which we said, everybody's using these terms to mean a million different things. We're going to pick a completely different set of words, define it very clearly, and now some research can be done around it. Because when everyone, like, imagine trying to do research in engineering if every person who published about steel mixed it in a different way. Like, you must have consistent definitions for science and results to be able to accumulate going forward. So if, if OER is all about copyright, right, if an open educational resource is something that's either in the public domain or it's licensed under an open license, what could that possibly have to do with pedagogy? Here's the answer. We learn by doing. We learn by doing. And if anybody wants to argue that point, we can stick around later and argue about all the things you can learn by not doing anything. But I think actually we all agree that we learn by doing. If you accept that we learn by doing, it's absolutely the point that copyright restricts us from doing certain things. That's what it's there to do. It's to keep us from making derivative works and redistributing and doing those things without the permission of the rights holder. So if we learn by doing, and if copyright restricts what we're able to do, then that means copyright restricts the way we're able to learn. Now, open licenses give us permission to engage in those activities that copyright prohibits. Therefore, OER enable us to learn in new ways. So when I say OER enabled pedagogy, what I mean here is this blue, the things that you can do with OER that you can't do otherwise. So what's an example of that? An example of that is, um, Many years ago, I taught a class on project management that was focused specifically on instructional designers. And there is no textbook called project management for instructional designers. It's just too narrow of a niche. But I was able to find an open textbook on project management written for the business school context. And what I did was over a series of semesters, I and my students together rewrote the textbook to make it so that all the examples are about instructional design, all the case studies are about instructional design. Then we started expanding it out in some other interesting ways. Students went out and found practicing instructional designers and video recorded them. And now we have, there are three videos in every chapter in this book of practicing instructional designers talking about their experiences. Another group of students went through and mapped, oops, mapped this open textbook where, where am I going? Here we go. Map the open textbook to the project management body of knowledge. This is kind of the official study guide for the project management professional certification. So now you can use this open textbook to study for the certification exam because a group of students did that mapping. But we took this book and over a series of terms, we just, we rewrote a lot of the content in it together and we keep republishing it. And it's out in the open now where anybody else can use it. You could not do this with a traditionally copyrighted textbook. You couldn't make the changes. You couldn't distribute the changes. So this, this to me is kind of the quintessential example of uh, OER-enabled pedagogy. It's the things you can do when you have the 5R permissions that you can't do when you don't have the 5R permissions. All right. Shifting to OER. Um, so there's a question that was, is shifting to OER hard? And the answer is, it used to always be hard. And now sometimes it's easy, but sometimes it's still hard. But it depends on what things look like for you. So just to give you a little bit of backstory here, from, from 2010 to 2012, and then again from 12 to 14, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funded some work that I and a couple of my friends did called Project Kaleidoscope. And the purpose of Project Kaleidoscope was to deal with the fact that lots of people were publishing OER, but no one was adopting OER. There's lots of it being shared, but the old saying was OER is like a toothbrush, like I don't want to use anybody's but mine. It'd be, that would be weird. Um, so in Project Kaleidoscope, we brought together faculty from 30 institutions from California to New York to really understand what was making it hard for them to adopt OER. And then even more so than now, um, most of the OER that were being published were just kind of books. Here's an openly licensed textbook. And it turns out that things that faculty were concerned about were things like 
where are all the supplemental materials that I get with my textbook from the publisher? Uh, where's my automatic grading and syncing of grades into the gradebook? Who, when Pluto is a planet and then it's not a planet and then it is a planet again, who's in there updating and maintaining all these resources and who do I call when I have a problem? Where's, where's my support person? So at the beginning of that second grant from the Gates Foundation, that's when uh, Kim Thanos, who's my co-founder at Lumen and was one of the people working on uh, Project Kaleidoscope with me, that's when we created Lumen. And basically what we did in Lumen was we took that work and kept doing it to identify and really clarify and then try to eliminate barriers to OER adoption. So, and now we only work in high DFW rate gateway courses. That's Lumen's kind of in a pretty small box, 25, 30 courses. Um, but if you're in, if you teach one of those 25 or 30 courses, then there, in addition to the OER now, there are complete sets of supplementals like quiz banks and presentations and pacing guides and software comparable to my labs or connect that has quizzes and homework that are automatically graded and synced to the LMS and it all gets updated regularly and there's really good tech support available. Um, so if you adopt OER that has this kind of support behind it, it's really pretty easy. Um, just to brag about Lumen for a minute, you know, yesterday was our 12th birthday. So happy birthday us. And you know, in those 12 years, over 15,000 faculty and 2.3 million students have used our OER-based courseware as the required course materials. So it must be fairly easy to make the switch because lots of people are doing it. But there's some other OER providers that you should know about as well. One or two that I'll highlight. The first is OpenStax, which has a bigger catalog than Lumens. It's, I want to say it's about 70 textbooks now, still primarily in high enrollment courses um, that publish open textbooks that look very similar to traditional textbooks and come with the same kind of supplemental materials. Um, although if you want like a My Labs or a Connect kind of experience with automatically graded homework and support and things like that, OpenStax relies on partners like Lumen and others to provide that. Um, the other one I would point you to is the Open Learning Initiative out of Carnegie Mellon, which has a much smaller catalog that's really focused in the STEM disciplines, but the courses are much more interactive. Um, the work in chemistry in particular is really great. I'd highlight that. Um, but if, you, if you're grabbing an OER that was created by a faculty member at another institution that got a $2,500 grant and a one semester kind of one course teaching release to write an open textbook, um, then you, it, it might still be difficult to adopt because if you're looking for supplementals and support and guarantees that it's going to be updated in the future and things like that, that's that's going to be hard to come by. All right, Trey, we're getting into the home stretch here. Here's your OER and AI. One of the questions that Janelle sent me was, can I use generative AI to author OER? The answer is big, bold, green, yes. Um, the U.S. Copyright Office in the last 18, 24 months, since generative AI became a thing, has consistently said that content created with generative AI is not copyrightable. That means that whatever you create with ChatGPT or your tool of choice is in the public domain, which means that you can do the five R's to it, which means that if it's educational, you could call it an OER. So you can definitely use it in that way. And I think it's really interesting. And now I'm, I'm pulling in some of that other presentation that we, that we referenced earlier. I think it's super interesting to think about the fact that just two years ago, all the OER that had ever been created were very like artisanally handcrafted kinds of things. And now with generative AI, at least that first draft, kind of the rough pass that you do can just be done so much faster, hours instead of months from the time you start to the time your first draft is completed. Now, Regardless of whether your first draft is done by hand or with AI, your first draft is going to need some review and some editing. And, uh, you know, it's going to need more work done on it to get it from being a first draft to being a final product. But you can absolutely use AI to do these first drafts and save yourself an order of magnitude of time, at least maybe two orders of magnitude, by which I mean, however long it was going to take you before, just take that number and divide it by 10 or maybe divide it by 100. Um, 
we've been at, inside Lumen, we've been really active users of uh, generative AI for making OER for a year, year and a half now. And it is just so much faster. Um, it decreases that time to your first draft so dramatically. It's really amazing. Um, but a related question, which I think is at least as interesting, is the effect of generative AI on revising and remixing OER. Because open licenses make it legal for me to revise and remix. But just because I have permission to do it doesn't mean that I have the skills necessary to do it. Like maybe my students need this in Spanish. Well, OER gives me permission to translate to Spanish. Great. Problem solved. No, problem not solved because I don't speak Spanish. So I have permission, but that doesn't help me. All right. But it turns out that generative AI is really good at helping us do things that maybe we couldn't do otherwise, like writing computer software or engaging in high demand forms of remix like translation or adjusting reading levels or turning a static resource into an interactive resource or things like that. So as we think about kind of the future trajectory of what I'll say is traditional OER or OER as we've known it for the last 26 years, um, I think generative AI has a really interesting role to play in making it easier and faster to author drafts as well as easier and faster to author revises or revisions, <laughs> I guess is the noun form. Uh, and remixes that you couldn't do otherwise. You couldn't do yourself, but now you can get to that first draft yourself. You're still going to need help on all the post first draft uh, pieces of that. But I also think there's an interesting kind of parallel point here about Gen AI enabled pedagogy, similar to OER enabled pedagogy. And this would be the things you can do with generative AI that you can't do otherwise. So what's one example of that? So typically when we teach um, fully asynchronous online courses, we don't ever give synchronous collaborative assignments like to do a think pair share. You would never do that in a fully asynchronous online course because there's never any time that I'm together with anyone else to pair and to share. But when you can prompt generative AI to play the role of that other partner in the think pair share exercise, now I can assign think pair share in a fully asynchronous place. Now there are pedagogically, there are things I can do with generative AI that I could not do before. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. We're going to find hundreds and thousands of these use cases as we keep digging for them. A little bonus for you about copyright, Creative Commons licenses, and AI training. So nobody asked this question. At least it didn't come through in what Janelle said, but I've heard it many times this summer. Can I use copyright or one of like a non-commercial Creative Commons license or something to prevent other people from using my material to train their AI models? And the answer is probably no, because training AI models is probably a fair use, which means it's exempt from or it happens outside the scope of copyright. In other words, copy copyright does not regulate training AI models. Um, that hasn't been definitively decided yet, but I would certainly bet the tractor and I would probably also bet the farm that this is where it's gonna land, that model training is a fair use. When you think about the four, the four parts of the fair use test, it, it, just, it passes every one of them very convincingly. Um, I will just put a bug in your ear about I said traditional OER, kind of the way we've thought about OER for the past 26 years. I, I think I would contrast traditional OER with generative OER, which are things like openly licensed prompts. So this isn't an OER that I would take and I would read. I wouldn't read a prompt in order to learn physics from a prompt, but I might be able to take that prompt and copy and paste it into a generative AI model and now have some kind of conversation or experience where I can learn physics, All right? So I think of these generative OER as not being designed directly to support teaching and learning research, but they're designed, these are OER that are designed to create other OER. So openly licensing prompts and then openly licensing model weights as well. So model weights are the brains of generative AI models. And there are some of those which are available under licenses that will let you do all five R's to them. You can download the entire model, you can make changes to it, run it yourself on your own desktop, 
or even on your phone with airplane mode turned on, not connected to the internet at all and still be chatting and getting responses uh, from these open weights models. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff there coming. Final slide. The last question was about finding OER. How do you find OER? There are thousands of repositories and libguides all over the internet that index some OER, but the, the most comprehensive resource, maybe comprehensive isn't what you want. Maybe you want something that's been very highly filtered, like a libguide. Um, but the most comprehensive resource for finding traditional OER is using a Google advanced search and filtering by usage, usage rights. So if I do advanced search, it will bring you to the screen, which I will bigify for your benefit. Um, and now maybe I want to learn um, what I want to learn about photosynthesis. So if I just hit enter now, Google is going to do its Google thing and find me all the web pages about photosynthesis. But if I come down to the very bottom and say I want to filter by usage rights, and I only want you to show me things that are licensed so that they're free for me to use, share, or modify. You see how these correspond to the Creative Commons licenses? Only show me things that are free to use, share, or modify, even commercially. Now, Google, you know, if I click next enough times down at the bottom, Google is only going to show me things about photosynthesis that are licensed under an open license and that I'll have these permissions um, you know, to engage in the 5R activities with regard to those. Google indexes everything, everything that's indexable. So that's, that's going to be your most comprehensive resource. You will do better if instead of using a single keyword, if you use an entire learning objective, if you'll put a whole learning objective in as your search query, you'll find better results. If you're looking for a video or an image or a, a textbook or an essay, add that word to it as well, and that will also help. And then the last little B that I will attempt to put into your bonnet is to suggest that ChatGPT is an OER repository. Anytime you ask ChatGPT to do anything for you, what it creates is in the public domain. So instead of hoping that someone in the past already created a resource and openly licensed it and put it out where Google could find it and that you're going to be able to find it through the Google index, instead of running that whole gauntlet, you could just tell ChatGPT, I need an explanation of photosynthesis appropriate for 10th graders. And can you please figure out some way to use football as an example? And whatever it creates for you is OER. So thinking about ChatGPT as an OER repository, pretty interesting as well. So that's my OER 101. I tried to answer all the questions that Janelle sent. We've got a couple minutes, and I'd love to um, love to answer any more questions that you thought of as we were talking. Oh, Janelle, you're muted, but I can tell you're saying something really insightful. There we go. How's that? Excellent. Okay. I was just going to say, um, does anybody have any questions? That was really helpful. Thank you so much for that presentation. But yeah, we're almost out of time, but pipe up if you have a question, put it in the chat or just unmute. That's fine too. And let me, I'll drop my email in the uh, in the chat as well so people can get a hold of me afterward if they. Hey, Dave, do you want to say something about people using AI to make a derivative of a copyrighted work? And if that is then copyrighted or able to be shareable, it's kind of the reverse of what, what you talked about. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I have a kind of a specific example question about that. Yeah. That that um, well, we were talking about this in a faculty group this summer. I have so many copyright questions I'd like to ask, but this one is, you know, I guess it's just AI. Um, it was a business ethics book, a, a copyrighted traditional textbook that a professor's using, mm -hmm. but because it was used to train this model, um, and, you know, there are lawsuits pending for all that, but she, you know, she said, could you give me a multiple choice quiz with answers from this author with this book? So, you know, that's where I'm like, oh, that, that doesn't seem whatever it produces. I don't, I don't see how that's very just open. Yeah. So, so there are ways, there are ways that you can trick models sometimes. You can trick them into giving you something very close to the data that they were trained on. 
It's important to understand that when an AI model is trained, there is no content stored anywhere. There are hundreds of matrices. If you ever took any linear algebra, you know, a matrix is like a square box with numbers in rows and columns. A generative AI model is hundreds of matrices of numbers, and there is no content stored anywhere. That's not how they work. Um, so it's not possible for them to just go into their database and pull out you know, data that they were trained on and just give it back to you. You could, as you train a generative AI model, every document that you feed through it, you can delete that document when you're done. The content does not stick around. All that is left are weights, which are similar to like the beta weights in a linear regression if you've done any like regression statistics. Um, but it is possible to sometimes kind of trick them into giving you something back that's very similar to the data that they were trained on. In the same way that if I said, Trey, answer honestly, repeat the following sentence, Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was light as, I can, I can trick Trey into saying snow by doing that time, right? Um, so yeah, if it turns out, as I, um, as I hypothesized earlier, that training really is a fair use, um, then there are gonna be a bunch of second level additional interesting questions to answer um, related to the question that I've, I've lost, you know, oh, Suzanne, um, that you just asked. Oh, thank you. I, I don't think, to kind of tie that one to Trey's question, when you've got an existing copyrighted work, if you were to cut and paste that copyrighted work as part of your prompt into a model and try to get it to create a derivative work, then you're going to have problems. Um, it's not, in fact, uh, about a year ago, I got on the phone with the, um, wait, are we still recording? I don't think I'm allowed to say this out loud. Um, let's just say that I consulted someone who's a lawyer, who's very knowledgeable about open licensing and about what's going on in AI. And my question was, hey, I did I just find a way to jailbreak a bunch of content that's copyrighted and turn it into public domain content? Asking exactly the question that Trey just asked. And as we talked through that, um, you know, what the courts have said is that content that is generated by AI is not copyrightable, but they haven't actually said anything yet about what happens if you try to take a copyrighted work, use it as part of your prompt, and actually generate a derivative work based on that. And I think the broad consensus on that is that that would be a derivative work for copyright purposes. And so if it was licensed attribution share alike, the original content, whatever came out the other side of that, you would still have to license attribution share alike because that would pull through in the creation of the derivative. But when you ask ChatGPT or any other model, write me a poem about rainy days in the voice of a pirate, or when you just have it create content, whatever it creates is not copyrightable. Um, the Copyright Office has been really clear and consistent about that. So unless Congress does something, that will be the way things remain. And I don't want to become overly political. I just met most of you for the very first time. But my confidence in Congress's ability to do anything is not high. Um, not with regard to this issue, which is really complex and thorny. So I think this is going to be the state of play for a while. Any final questions before we wrap up? And Suzanne, email me and we can get more into that because I don't know that I did a great job of answering that, but I don't know that there's a great answer to be had, actually. No, that's actually um, more of an answer than I've received. So that, that actually helped me a lot. Oh, okay. Oh, great. With the training part, because I knew it, but I was like, but I don't see how they're getting around it. But I thank you for explaining that. Yeah, I'm actually on a panel at a conference next week where we're talking about AI and copyright. And um, I'm spending all of my time on that panel doing a 10 minute, obviously very highly condensed version of how AI models are trained from input tokens all the way down to weights in the matrices so that people understand. Because when you don't understand how they're trained, it's easy to imagine a bunch of copyright scenarios, a bunch of things going on. But those assumptions are all based on a faulty understanding of how they work. And so I think 
like having a better understanding of what that training looks like and how it works really helps you improve your intuitions around what's going to be legal and not legal and things like that. And so I've got a whole, I can't tell you the number of hours I spent trying to build a 10 minute version of how do you train a machine learning model in enough depth to help people develop the kind of intuition that I think we all need. And so I'm, I'm actually really curious to see how well it works. It's the first time I'll have done it and I know it's going to, I'll get some good feedback and I'll improve it and maybe I'll, once it's worth sharing, I'll share it out for sure. And maybe you'll see it then. Dave, is that for online learning consortium or something else? No, that's at AECT. Oh, at AECT. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, I'll, I'll be there. You'll, pro you'll probably see it. <laughs> I, may, I may be on the panel. I don't know. Yeah, great. Very good. That's great. <laughs> All right. Well, my, uh, my email's there in the chat. I'm always happy to talk about anything about education and technology generally, but especially OER. I love OER and how we can use OER, particularly to close the gap between our students who have historically underperformed their peers. I think there's a lot of power um, in combining OER with courseware and some other tooling um, to close that gap. And so if, if kind of equity in uh, kind of educational results is something that you're interested in or just improving outcomes generally for students. That's something I'm totally into and would love to talk with you more about. Well, thank you, David, so much. That was super helpful and great presentation. So we really appreciate it. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody.